so guys all set everyone's on mute all good man how are you doing good thank you for helping me out with that nahi nahi that was good theek hai Hi. Hi, boss. Hi, Dr. Kamal. How are you? So, who is testing us for audios? I am, sir. We can hear you loud. It's loud and, and clear. Yeah. I can't hear you. Uh, why can't? Uh, and the jeez just check if you can make me co-host or not is there an option hello not really sir either okay. i can hello. mute so you can be i can't hear any of you so you need to fix your audio niche select uh, mic ke sath ek option hai can you hear me chat mein galat hai uh, kamal sir hi guys hi pradeep how are you All well. How are you? All great, man. Excellent. You look good. <laughs> look at the hair and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Change, man. I think you got a whiskey glass in your hand, man. On your left hand. In your left hand. Do you have one? What's that? A glass of whiskey in your left hand. Of course, it is there. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Hey, pretty. Hi. How are you? Hello. Hi, Tom. You're looking good. Hi, you got you? a new mustache that I see on you? Hello. Kamal, we can hear you. Okay. Maybe then my headphone is not doing well. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. I think headset is discharged. Uh, That's why probably. Is it fine? My voice is fine. Okay. All right. All right. Then I'm going to be without it. Yes. Tom, how are things in US? Everyone is uh very safe here in the Midwest. Uh my daughter, oldest daughter is in uh Brooklyn, New York, and it's still kind of crazy in New York right now. But most American surgeons, you know, we haven't operated in almost 2 months, which is the longest amount of time most of us have gone without actually performing surgery. So that's very different. Wow. Okay. So I presume I presume do you don't take trauma on call that's why that's the reason you're not yeah. <clears throat> That's right. Yeah, you know, so the vast majority of the foot and ankle guys that you know we have purely elective practice and so many of us stopped doing trauma so many years ago. Yes. And um so it's been a good thing until you know the virus hit. <laughs> so some of us we've just been at home doing nothing. Which yeah. has been a good thing. It hasn't been that bad. I know. I know. Yeah, increasing in India as well, and especially in Mumbai, is the numbers are just uh, phenomenal. So, Pradeep, really? are you yeah. operating or not? Who me? Yeah. Uh, very, very occasionally. Means in the last, uh, I would say, month and a six weeks, I have probably done three cases. Again, trauma. Okay. Only trauma, yeah. New trauma. Yeah. We've started a bit of elective in Delhi now, so uh, because the cases are not, you know, that bad. and uh, but i think we may go up after the lockdown ends so don't know what's going to happen eventually yeah. but yeah, yeah mumbai I think, i think is increasing quite a lot isn't it yes. yes and i think in mumbai and in maharashtra probably we will extend till 31st probably that's for sure yeah yeah <clears throat> absolutely so in the jeet youtube is okay it's working fine perfect Great. I spotlighted Tom. Everyone can see only Tom. Yeah, we can see Tom. <laughs> Tom, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you, Gao. Okay, lovely, lovely. Hi, yeah. hi. Headset is working fine hi, now. Buddy. How are you? Oh, I like, I, well, like how are you? I like the background. <laughs> <laughs> Good Thanks. evening, Gao. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Maninda and Kamal, we haven't yeah, had nice to meet you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> lovely to meet you both. Great to see you, yeah. This is going to be the new social platform, really, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll tend to forget conferences, you know. We will if we regularly yeah. keep having these kind of uh, social platforms. Yeah, a year from now, we'll see, like, where did we first meet? Oh, we met on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how the conversation will go. So next time we can all bring a drink, you know, and have it along with, you know, to have yeah, more cheers. social yeah. environment. Cheers. Some of us already have our drink. Well, why next time? Yeah, yeah. Why next time? <laughs> no, we can have a session after the you know webinar, uh, uh, fifteen twenty minutes only for drinks. Only for drinks, yes. Uh, it should not yeah. be stream. Oh, we should not be stream live on YouTube. Okay, yeah, that's no, what. not on the live, not live on the YouTube, but only for the panelists. We can yes. we can have a. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that will be a good, uh, you know, social meeting. You, pop, you probably have the most, you probably have the most hits for the webinar. If you, if everyone yeah. gets to watch the faculty having drinks. <laughs> like, well, yeah. well, I think the, in the instructions to the panelists, I think there should be a recipe for a cocktail as well for everybody yeah. to make the same one. <laughs> <laughs> that you know that I'm a teetotaler, so I will have to, I have to leave that then. <laughs> Dr. Rajiv Shah has joined us yet or not? Rahul He's joining there. in a minute, sir. I just spoke oh, to him. Okay. Abhishek and Rajiv Shah, sir, are left. Everyone else is here. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, uh, Rahul and Gurunath. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you guys? Fine, fine. <coughs> so we are just waiting for Dr. Rajiv Shah and uh, Abhishek. And Abhishek to <coughs> join us. And after that, we can just move on towards. Let me break a news to you. Yeah. Abhishek got married. Really? <laughs> I thought he got engaged. He no, he's got, he's got he got married, married? on ninth. Wow. So, so Once in a lifetime opportunity to get married in a lockdown period. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we all the moment he comes, we should all congratulate him. That should be the first thing. Yeah. All right. But we are already Congratulations under Congratulations on getting locked down during lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We are already under lockdown. Why why you want to get a double lockdown? <laughs> <laughs> we are already under lockdown. <laughs> Hold on. Just give me one minute. Yeah. He's you know, got you can... somebody to share with, you know, in the lockdown now. Having a lockdown alone and having somebody to share with the feelings of lockdown <laughs> is a little different. <laughs> Manut can just uh, try his slides because uh, his is gonna be the first one. So password meeting ID of Lily J eight to nine. Meeting ID. I think he's already done it in the trial session. Hi Abhishek. Hi, congrats, man. Congratulations, Abhishek. Oh, Abhishek is here. Congratulations, Abhishek. Well, we can see the congratulations in the background. Congratulations, he can hear, <laughs> but he, he, he has to unmute himself. Yes. You have to unmute. Abhishek, please unmute yourself. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. Now, uh, now, lots of congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So if 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 your if your partner is around, let us congratulate her also. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Uh, just a second. Uh, Abhishek, congratulations. congratulations. Please keep focused on Abhishek. Please, please keep him on the main screen. <laughs> keep Abhishek on the main screen. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. We are really happy. We are really happy to yes. get this news. Congratulations, Abhishek. And good evening, everybody. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Rajiv, sir. Good evening. 
Yes. Oh, Why is that my screen is just getting out? My video is stopping <laughs> and coming and stopping. <laughs> you must have put your video off, you know. You need to put that video button yeah, I, on. I yeah. kept it on. Yeah. Okay. You just come and go all the time. Why is that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, That's you are here now. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Hi. Hello Dr. Chong Lee. Hello, Dr. Shah. It's How good are to you, see sir? you. Yeah. I am fine. Yeah. <laughs> and my family and everyone here is safe. Yeah, that's great. That's a great news. Uh, so your video is in and out again. Yeah, okay. why is it that? So I think you need a new laptop. <laughs> yes, I don't think so. <laughs> Maninder has put the right diagnosis, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, do you want me to log out? Yeah, the host has asked to start your video. Start my video. I'm starting it, then it is dropping down. Mm. I don't know. So, do you want to log me in again, <coughs> Manin, uh, Indajit? Yes, sir. You can try that. I mean, but you'll have to shut all the other applications you have open on your laptop. Yeah. He's gone. Okay. So, uh, sir, it's four minutes to go. I'll try and get him in. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, then we can start and he can join us later on. Yeah. Uh, we should try and start on time. Yeah. Uh, we have four more minutes to go, I think. Yes, sir. Four more minutes. So, on YouTube, we have at the moment six, eight viewers. And it's increasing. I have asked even Ortho TV to uh, Madhut Manuth has tried to you know connect with Ortho TV also something like this. Yeah, so what they're going to do is I think they're not live streaming, but they'll take the stream later on and probably try to put it. Uh, okay. We'll have a word in the EC about that. I think we we already had that, so we'll talk about it later. Okay, okay, okay. But yeah, okay. they were quite interested because the program looks very exciting for them as well. It's a pandemic going on and an epidemic of webinars. Webinars. Well, you tend to delete all the messages of webinars as soon as they come. I just clear it out. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, in a day, you have 10 webinars. 10 yeah. at least. 8 to 10 at least, yes. And everybody is planning 10 more. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably then go into... Something called as a withdrawal of webinars once the lockdown goes away. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, here in America, we have uh, we don't have that many webinars. But what I have found is this is an excellent chance to have an international conference. Yeah. Because, of course, it's free. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And so uh, as you plan these, Feel free to uh, invite any Americans that you want because it's so easy for us. And especially so, with your time frame and the time shift, it's not a problem at all. And so I think this may be a great yeah. opportunity to get most of the uh, Indian orthopedic surgeons uh, accustomed yep. uh, and get them a chance to meet some of the American, European, mm -hmm. Singaporean guys so, with a greater frequency. Video, video is it related with my internet connection? Uh, no, sir. I don't think it is related to your internet. It might be, you know, the uh, the flap of the laptop. When you move it, it might go, you know. Is that the reason? When you move no, it, I don't flap? think so. No? Okay. Yeah. So, any other application open in the background which uses No, camera? I don't think so. I don't think so. Huh? Then your camera, camera is it stable? Yeah, camera is not stable. Yeah. Let, let me just ask my. Uh, Do you have an external camera which you can put in and then you can try that? Or you can come on the mobile. Or you can just come on the mobile phone. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the next best option. Yeah. But should we wait or should we start the things? I think we should start on time at 8.30 because it will be a long, long yeah. day of discussion and I'm sure the, now yeah. also it will be quite late for him as well. Uh, Dr. Indrajit, can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. I can. I was trying to fix Rajiv sir. We should start. Uh, hey, you yeah. just ask Dr. Rajiv Shah. Can we start? And he can. Yes, wait. yes. We 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 start. We start. Maybe if my uh, uh, video is not coming, my voice. No, it's coming, sir. Voice. It's coming okay. now, sir. Yeah. We can yes. we can see you, okay. sir. Okay. So uh, good okay. evening, friends. Uh, all the panelists. I am very thankful to you for being here, and uh, all the viewers who have spared the time for this webinar. It is an honor, my pleasure, to introduce uh, the STEAM faculty today, and we are very thankful to Dr. Gao and Dr. Tom Lee, particularly, who have uh, you just spared their valuable time to be with us this evening. So, first of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Tom Lee, who is a graduate from Columbia University and has uh, done fellowship in foot and ankle surgery from the famous Thomas Jefferson. University Hospital, Philadelphia. He is uh, founded uh, Orthopedic Foot and Clinic Center in Ohio, which has been giving training to lots of surgeons from all around the world. He is a past president of AOFS and uh, chief in foot and ankle surgery in the Ohio State University. And he's examiner for the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, reviewer to Foot and Ankle International, General of Bone and Joint Surgery, with more than 75 peer-reviewed papers, and he is involved in many active designs uh, uh, with different companies. He has got many designs patent. We welcome you, sir, for today's webinar, and we are indeed very thankful to you uh, for joining us. Secondly, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Gao. He is a consultant orthopedic surgeon and foot and ankle surgeon from Raffles Hospital, Singapore. He is an honorary senior lecturer in Nanyang Technical University, Singapore. He is a course and trust instructors in Arthroscopy Association of North America and Royal College of Surgeons of England. He is a senior clinical lecturer in Jonglu Lin Medical School, and he is a scientific program chair for CCOT and chairman for the foot and ankle section of the CCOT. He is also national delegate of CCOT for Singapore and he has 34 peer-reviewed publications. Welcome you, uh, Dr. Gao. Now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the Indian faculty. And uh, like every webinar, it has to start with Dr. Rajiv Shah, uh, the permanent feature of all these webinars, a foot and ankle surgeon for um, uh, Sunchild Global Hospitals, Vidodra, Baruch, and Surat, executive council member of the Global Foot and Ankle Council, a vice chairman in Asia Pacific Foot and Ankle Council, then South Asia coordinator for the International Advisory <laughs> Board meeting Foot Innovate. He's a past president of uh, Indian Foot and Ankle Society and is well known for his hand book on foot and ankle, which was awarded as the best book by the Bombay Orthopedic Society. So now I move on to the next line of uh, uh, panelists. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kamal Dureja, who is a consultant and head of foot and ankle surgery at the Max Specialty Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. And he has been faculty to many foot and ankle courses. And then I welcome Pradeep Manoop, foot and ankle specialist and sports me medicine specialist from Breach Candy Hospital, Reliance and Reliance Hospital. He has been trained in UC London and he has more than 150 international and national publications and he is reviewed to various national and international uh, and his uh, journals and he's a committee member of the American Foot and Ankle Society. Then I welcome uh, Maninder Shaw, who is a chief foot and ankle surgeon from the Indian Spinal Center, New Delhi. He is the editor of foot and ankle uh, uh, section of the Indian Journal of Orthopedics and associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Orthopedics and Trauma and a guest editor in foot and ankle uh, uh, annals of joint surgery. And then I move on to the uh, next line of uh, uh, budding young foot and ankle surgeons who are going to present the cases uh, today. <clears throat> Dr. Parthiban, foot and ankle surgeon from Chennai and executive council member of IPAS. AO fellow in Switzerland, and then again, foot and ankle fellowship he has done from Switzerland. He has been faculty to many courses uh, in India. Then Dr. Abhishek Jain, recently married. Congratulations, Abhishek. Uh, foot and ankle surgeon from Delhi, and he owns a Delhi Foot Clinic. 
So he uh, has a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery from Germany, South Korea, and uh, he has also an active member of IFAS and national faculty to many BOFAS courses. Our Indajit, who has been uh, very active in organizing these webinars, he is foot and ankle surgeon from Delhi, and our webinar coordinator is done fellowship in foot and ankle surgery in University of Alabama and is an executive member of Indian Foot and Ankle Society. And then uh, Dr. Gurunath, he is from Solapur. He is an assistant professor in BM Medical College. He has a Solapur and he has done a fellowship in UAB and he Lee Shaw Fellowship from National University Hospital Singapore. And finally, the last young surgeon from uh, Jaipur, that is uh, Rahul Apadia, who has done fellowship in foot and ankle reconstruction in Singapore, and he's a founder of the Jaipur Foot and Ankle Society, and he's an ex-committee member of Indian Foot and Ankle Society, and a member of the Seacott Foot and Ankle Committee. And now I hand over uh, to the moderator, Dr. Rajisha, to uh, invite the uh, first speaker. Well, good evening. You might not see my face, but you would be able to uh, listen to me. Uh, well, uh, uh, we will go in this manner. First, pathoanatomy of the calcaneus small union would be introduced by Dr. Pradeep Munur. And thereafter, we will have case presentation and discussions. The most important thing is that we have on board my own mentor, uh, Professor Dr. Tom Lee, who has been very kind to join with us in this uh, webinar. And I especially acknowledge his presence into this webinar. So over to you, Pradeep. Pradeep, you can start your sharing your screen. In the, can you give the screen to uh, Pradeep? Already with him, sir. OK. Dr. Pradeep. I think he can't. Can he hear us? Right here, a second man. We have lost it from there. Should I give him a call? He's rejoining, sir. It is dropped off. He's rejoining. We can introduce Parthiban, sir, till then. He's just joined us. Dr. Parthiban has just joined us. Yeah. We, yeah. Hello. Good evening, John. So. So maybe if he's, if he's not able to join, can we ask uh, Dr. Rahul to start with his case? We can, sir. He's joined in, sir. He's come back. Yeah. Okay. Come back. So, Pathiban has just joined us. Yes, sir. No, I think we are waiting for Pradeep. Pradeep, yeah. did he, yeah, yeah. is he joining or we start with yeah, Rahul? Yeah, yeah, he is. He is Pradeep is here. Okay, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Not yet. Yeah, we not, can. Not screen. Just about starting. It's, yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Rajivisha. Indian Foot and Ankle Society and the international faculty. Um, I'll be talking about pathoanatomy of the calcaneum malunion. So we start with a case, a 37 year old doctor had an open fracture of the calcaneum almost 18 months back, he was treated with K-wire. He presented to me with this kind of deformity with the hind foot is going in valgus, pain on the medial side and the lateral side, finding it unstable on walking on uneven surface. And also you can see on the right side, the toes, also he was having clawing and difficulty uh, uh, in walking as well. Uh, X-rays were done on the right and the left side, and you can see a lot of things going on. Okay, so you can see exhaust is here, uh, flattening, lateral wall is um, widened, and also the CT scan here as well. So why are we going to discuss on calcare malunion and what is the plan or what do we do next? And Cotton in the right from 1908, he described that os calcis fractures are of interest because they give so large a percentage of cripples. And because these cripples are strong men as a rule in youth and vigorous middle age. 
Furthermore, he noted more and more a number of cripples untreated very often diagnosed as sprained ankles in the early weeks. And I think this dictum still holds true in this uh, era as well. So coming to what next? Before we do that, we need to understand the pathoanatomy of the calcaneum malunion, where what are the bones involved, are the bony deformities, the tendon structures, neural and other soft tissue involvement as well. So let's come to the pathomechanics. Uh, we know the fact that the axial load drives the lateral process or the talus into the lateral wall of the calcaneus, finally affecting either an extra-articular or an intra-articular part of the calcaneum fracture. The tuberosity fragment translates laterally and superiorly, thereby finally you have a reduction or a decrease in the height of the calcaneum. The decrease in the height alters the lever arm effect of the calcaneus. It also gives a tailor, uh, flattens the tailor inclination, thereby reducing the tailor calcaneum angle and thereby leading to fibular impingement. Also, because of the lateral blowout, there is increase in the width of the calcaneum, which results in a lateral exostosis, which has its own side effects. And we know the fact that more than two millimeter of displacement of the posterior facet changes the load bearing characteristic of the subtalar joint, thereby leading to subtalar arthritis. So if we, dis if we uh, classify the problems with calcaneum malunion can be divided into bony problems, joint problems, tendon and neurological, and we take one by one. So let's talk about the bony problems. We know the fact because of the blowout, you have a lateral wall, which is um, the exostosis is there, leads to widened heel, which is called as a Kashiwagi syndrome. There are painful exostoses, which, uh, which can uh, have a problems in uh, difficulty in wearing a normal footwear, especially the lateral bulge or the posterior bulge, and even on the plantar side. Because of the loss of the height, there is a loss in the, uh, there is a decrease in the tailor inclination, thereby causing an anterior impingement of the ankle joint and reducing the dorsiflexion. And of course, if there's a severe deformity, you have a hind foot, Varus or valgus. The next is the joints. Usually the most common joint infected are the subtalar joints and the calcaneal cuboid joint, which can lead to arthritis. Of course, in a long-standing deformity, the ankle joint can also get affected because of the tailor tilt and also because of the anterior ankle impingement, thereby reducing the dorsiflexion. But ultimately, it can also give rise to osteoarthritis. We know the fact because of the hind foot deformities, there is a calcinofibular joint impingement as well. The third part is the tendons. Which are the tendons? The most common tendons involved are the peroneal tendons, which can cause either pero peroneal tendonitis or further leading to stenosis, impingement, and finally a subluxation or a uh, dislocation of the peronea. And this is again because of multitude of issues, either the lateral wall is, um, uh, there is a lateral wall widening, exostosis there, or a significant hind foot valgus present. And finally, any neurological issues. And this is again because of the inflammation or irritation, either because of the posterior tibial nerve or the sural nerve. And this is because again, because of the multiple significant displacement of the medial fragments or the lateral fragments, also, do not forget that these patients may have been operated. So, post-op, iatrogenic injuries to these nerves can also be an issue. And that's why these patients should be examined before we undertake any operative um, uh, treatment for these patients. Radiographs are very, very important in these patients. We need a standing AP and lateral views, both of the ankle as well as the foot. You need an axial views or the Harris views. Do not forget the broadest view because that gives you a good um, uh, idea of what is happening in the posterior facet. And last but not the least, a standing Salzman view is very important, gives you an alignment of the hind foot as well. CT scan is the mainstay um, of these patients uh, for investigations. It's a very reliable tool. Uh, you need to see the CT scan if you can get a digital copy where you can actually cut the sections, look at both the 2D sagittal and coronal views to understand what is happening with these difficult malunions. And of course, finally, you can do a 3D reconstruction, which helps in complete understanding and further planning as well. Coming to classification, the first classification was given by Stefan and Sanders, and it was a very basic classification, helpful, where the type one was lateral exostosis or a lateral, uh, lateral width plus minus only the lateral side of the joint having a 
subtalar arthritis. Type 2, lateral exostasis with complete subtalar joint arthritis. And third was along with the type 2, but severe deformities. That was a very broad uh, categorization of these malunions. What they failed to discuss was what was happening with the soft tissue, what was happening with the joints, other joints, what was happening with the hind foot height. They did not look into this. So Zip and Remar further did a classification in 2003 where they classified from type 0 to type 5, where 0 was uh, only subtalar arthritis or, um, sorry, a malunion without arthritis. Type 1 was with arthritis. Type 2 was with a severe virus of valgus deformity. Type 3 was with a loss of height. Um, type 4 with a significant lateral translation of the body. And type 5 where the ankle joint also get involved. They also, along with it, um, defined type A, B, C, where A was malunion, B was non-union, and C was avian of the calcaneum. And this almost gave a complete picture of a uh, calcaneum malunion and um, help in the prognosis as well as the treatment protocol. Uh, our own Indian, Dr. Rajusha himself has a classification which is called the ADENO, which um, A stands for arthritis, D for deformities, E for exhaustosis, I for any implant issues, N for nerve problems, and O is for other soft issues. Um, uh, Dr. Shah was kind enough to share these slides. A, where you have subtalar joint arthritis. B, there is significant deformities of the hind foot. E is for exhaustosis, mainly on the lateral side. I, any implant issue, you could have a screws or plates. N is for nerve, mostly a sural nerves or a posterior table nerve. And O in other cases, looking at mostly tendo achilles contractures or any other soft tissue problems. So what are the treatment goals of these patients? The most of the, the things you want to do is help this patient uh, get rid of the pain and improve the alignment. Of course, initially a conservative treatment is always the norm, but if they fail, then you would, would like to improve the hind foot alignment, decrease bony prominences, thereby reducing the pain. And the treatment consists of mainly bony reconstruction and soft tissue reconstruction. They go hand in hand. Um, bony, you have other a uh, lot of things in your armamentarium. You can do a plain exhaustectomy, in situ fusion, distraction arthrodesis, osteotomy or co combination. And in soft tissue, you're looking at peroneal tendons, um, repair of it, Achilles lending, neurolysis, and if, if any other soft tissue issues are there. So coming back to our case, um, this patient who presented earlier. So what are the problems you can see? You have subtalar joint arthritis, you can see here. You can see here the lateral wall as well as the plant exhaustosis here. There's a complete loss of Gessen's angle. The hind foot of the posterior facet is completely flat, thereby leading to a loss of hind foot height, thereby leading to anterior impingement in this case. And of course, there is a significant valgus deformity present. The same patient CT scan, what do you see? That's a calcaneum tuberosity completely out of the alignment. And here you can see a peroneal tendons, how they were causing a calcaneofibular impingement. Uh, so this is what we did. A plant exhaustectomy was done, lateral wall excised, um, distraction arthritis is done, valgus was completely corrected, and that's your intra picture. Another case, discussions, 57-year-old, he had an open deduction fixation done two years back, and you see that, that's a hind foot which he came with. The skin is also puckered on the lateral side, and that's the kind of x-rays uh, which he came with. CT scan was done, and let's read the CT scan. So what are the issues we have? Joints, subtalar joint affected, and, and as well as the ankle joint is affected. On the lateral side, the whole lateral, we have a lateral wall bulge, exhaustosis present, severe valgus are present, peronia are impinging on this area, and of course, skin is an issue because it's a previous operated case, so we have to be very careful. So I got a 3D model, and plan the cut where exactly the osteotomy should be done. And this is the pre-op and the post-op of the three model and planning help in the case. Um, patient went to do very well. And this is the post-op picture one year down the line. And then the last case for discussion, 53 year old male, uh, open reduction fixation done nine months back. I came to me with pain, deformity, unable to do activities and see how the toes have been affected. This is probably a missed compartment syndrome uh, post-operatively. And also you can see the scar present as well, which has healed. And you see this X-ray and see the CT scan. There is a calcaneum malunion present, not a severe deformities, but significant loss of the tailor height as well. So what are the issues here? Subtalar joint is gone, non-union with calcaneum fibrosity and anterior process, 
uh, loss of hind foot height, skin, we have to be very careful. Those have to be um, sorted out as well. And of course, implants were in situ, so that needs to be got rid before we do the surgery. So open it up, remove all the implants. Here you can see a gap, that's your tail is right underneath, uh, almost going up to the flow. Uh, allograph was done, reconstructed the calcaneum, got the height back and got the alignment back. So in conclusion, malunions, what, uh, things need to be looked at, sig significant varus valgus, malalignment or shortening needs to be uh, looked at properly and planned properly, joints, ankle, subtalar or uh, calcaneum cuboid joint are affected or not, bony side, lateral wall, plantar side or medial exostosis present or not, that needs to be looked at properly. Tendons, peroneals, antibellus, posterior tendons, and official tendon, I would say, if they keep causing official tendonitis, and neurological issues. A good wheel of uh, clinical examination along with appropriate radiograph and CT scan is a must. And in your treatment, always do both bony reconstruction and soft tissue reconstructions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pradeep. And uh, thank you very much for complete exposition of the topic. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, so yes. can I, uh, can we ask Dr. Rahul to present his case? Dr. Rahul, start sharing your screen, please. Okay, I hope my screen is visible here. Yeah, yeah it's working out. Here you go. Thank you. So I would like to thank IFAS here for giving the opportunity and also a special mention to Professor Gao because he happens to be my mentor and I'm really happy that he is here in this uh, webinar. So we'll start with a very simple case of malignated calcaneum. So this was a young female who presented six months post uh, injury, a uh, 24 year old female. She was a recreational athlete and sustained injury to her left calcaneum due to fall from the parallel bars. She was diagnosed with a calcaneum fracture and was managed conservatively. And then later on, she presented with complaints of pain while walking and gait abnormality. So this was an X-ray where we can see that uh, there was a conductive depression, complete facetal depression with mild virus uh, deformity of the heel. So we did a CT scan and to look for the, uh, the joint surface, the status of arthritis, of the subtalar arthritis and the angulation, the deformity that needed to be corrected in both the planes. So, and we proceeded with the extensile lateral approach. So preoperatively, we had a thorough discussion with the patient uh, about, uh, about the various options available. And uh, when we discussed patient was not keen for the fusion surgery. She was young and she wanted to go back to her recreational activities and tracking activities. So though we explained her that she might need a surgery later on, even if we try to salvage her joint, but she was very much willing for a second surgery if needed. So we decided for a joint salvage here and uh, we went ahead with an extensive lateral approach. We did uh, the lateral wall exosectomy, uh, explored the facet, we see we can have a view of the joint facet here. We did an osteotomy in both the planes of the facet, lifted the facet using a joystick K wire and got it realigned with the posterior facet of the uh, talus. So after realignment, we did a temporary fixation with a K wire. Uh, under CM, we observed both AP and uh, axial views to make sure that we have a reasonably good uh, the axial view and the alignment of the heel. And once we had achieved that, we went ahead and fixed with a small uh, reckon plate. Now this implant had to be used because of uh, some misadventure over the table where we could not use the uh, the calcaneum plate. And uh, this was the next best implant available to us. So we had to use this. So after this, we kept patient uh, immobile for a period of uh, two months or eight weeks. After that, we started her on mild exercises of uh, subtalar joint and this was her four month post op video
and she was due to come again for a post op scan, six month post op scan, but due to COVID, she did not come. So we are waiting for this case to get over. So basically, the main question that we come, uh, we get after this kind of uh, surgery is so how viable is the option of uh, a joint salvage, especially. What is the cut of time where we can think about a joint salvage versus with a uh, fusion of the subtalar joint? And uh, is there a role of a partial facetectomy like uh, a scoop surgery where we can take a part of the involved arthritic joint surface along with the lateral wall? So now this is open for discussion and uh, uh, opinion of the senior panels here. So Thank you. May, may I start with Professor Gao? Uh, your viewpoint on this case any questions, any comments you want to have asked to Dr. Rahul? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Rajiv. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Thank you, thank you. Rahul, that's, uh, that's a very, uh, very challenging case and well done uh, in trying to get her back uh, onto her feet. Can mm -hmm. I just double check? She presented to you six months after the index injury, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, the first thing I would say is this is a difficult situation. Uh, I mean, all calculated malunions are difficult. Uh, that's the first thing I would say, uh, and it's a spectrum. But this is a difficult situation for two reasons. Firstly, because of her age, and therefore her functional demands. And secondly, because it's six months uh, down the line, and you have a patient who doesn't want to have a fusion. Yes. Uh, I must say, in my practice, uh, I would probably offer her a fusion or nothing. Uh, and the reason I would say that is because I think uh, trying to reconstruct a joint six months down the line, and especially when they've had associated bony and soft tissue consequences uh, of having a malunited calcaneum for so long, uh, it's actually the results are, are very difficult to reproduce consistently. Uh, but as with all cases, uh, we have patients who accept that they may require fusion in a delayed phase and they still want to go for reconstruction. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a reasonable approach. The second question of cutoff time. Um, so I think this is a tricky question. The first thing I would say is there's no, there's no data out there that I'm aware of uh, that tells us that beyond a certain time slot or time period, uh, we can still do a reconstruction or salvage versus beyond a certain cutoff time where fusion. It's a bit like the Lisfranc joint as well. People argue about this a lot, about how long can you leave a list frank uh, join before you have to proceed and fuse it uh, as opposed to try and salvage and reconstruct it so i think firstly there's no data but i think the important thing in the setting of calcaneal malunions is the longer the patient is from the time of the index injury they start developing complications just like pradeep has said and the complications are phenomenal they're huge you start getting bony complications you start getting soft tissue complications um, and the things that we're talking about and the things that often the literature talks about is just about the joint reconstruction and alignment restoration. But everything else that comes with the as a sequelae of uh, the calcaneal malunion uh, needs to be addressed as well. And I think the history and examination in a calcaneal malunion is absolutely critical because the patient may present with pain that is not directly related to the alignment of the joint itself, in which case going in and reconstructing the joint or going in and fusing the joint may not necessarily solve their problem. So I, uh, my answer to that cutoff time issue is there's no data, and I think I would treat it on a on a case per case basis. Uh, finally, partial testectomy. Ooh, I think that's very tricky. Uh, that comes under the realm of uh, you know people. Uh, there is some data about. Uh, or there's some authors that have talked about going in through uh, cleavage planes of fractures uh, and opening up the original fracture at, it, at its own cleavage plane and correcting the deformity at its cora, its original cora. Uh, I have no experience with that. I think that's a very difficult operation. Um, and uh, I mean, I'll show some slides later about my uh, kind of algorithm for dealing with, uh, as far as surgical technique is concerned. But I think a partial facetectomy, I think, uh, is, is a very difficult procedure, and I don't think the results are going to be consistently reproducible. So uh, I wouldn't put that on the top three options on my list. Uh, thank you, Go. 
there is a paper there is a chinese paper who have done the osteotomy even as late as uh, 8 to 9 months even beyond that for calcaneus malleolus so there is a literature support dr gov for that uh, the uh, more better way of lifting it is with the cases where you have a tongue type of malleolus like rahul at son so more so with the tongue type of malleolus that you can do such an osteotomy even as late as 8 to 9 months or beyond if you don't find the um, uh, evidence of uh, arthritis uh, secondly yes for even a fresh calcaneus fracture if there is a far lateral small fragment i have many times removed that fragment as long as you have a larger subtalar surface to connect and load bear i think you can do partial facetectomy partial uh, uh, removal of the articular facet but these are my views i would like to know view of my mentor uh, dr tom lee sir over to you thank you rajiv i want to make a comment on cartilage metabolism and that is how does the cartilage of any joint stay viable and we know that it has to have opposition to another cartilage and it needs to be bathed in synovial fluid So when you have a dislocation of a joint surface like this posterior facet or as Dr. Gao said how about a Liss Frank or let's take it to an extreme how about a shoulder dislocation how long can that cartilage be out of sync without being bathed in synovial fluid before the cartilage cells and the cartilage matrix ends up dying And of course we don't know that we know it at the basic science level that is probably about 3 to 6 weeks but we don't know. And so in my mind 6 months certainly is a very long time for that cartilage to be out of sync or dislocated not opposed to another cartilage surface. And so I I agree with everyone that the primary way to go here would have been the fusion. Having said that, obviously this 24-year-old woman said no way. I don't want to do that. And I think Rahul you did a great job getting it back a post because the other the secondary goal is of course to get the bony anatomy back. Would you did a terrific job. You got the length back, you got the height back. And so should her cartilage die, and I think most of us agree that in a couple years it probably will. it'll make the subtalar fusion easier later. Thank you. In terms of removing elements of the facet again, I think we're all aligned in this behind Dr. Shah and that is if it's a small piece, 10%, 25%, sure, get rid of it. If it's 50%, and obviously that's going to be a little bit more difficult, but a small piece absolutely as long as it doesn't affect the structural integrity. So on a basic science level, I think this was dealt with appropriately and i do think we do have some guidance of how long a piece of cartilage can be out of sync thank you tom uh, dr rahul there is a question by dr rao that what is the risk of avascular necrosis of the articular fragment when you are doing after 6 months so i don't think that our uh, avascular necrosis should be a uh, much of a concern here because we have well opposed uh, a bony fragment and uh, i don't see any reason that we we have uh, changed the blood supply to the calcaneum here okay any comment from dr kamal dr maninder dr pradeep any comment any question yeah one uh, yeah okay start with maninder please so uh, thank you uh, basically what i would like to say in uh, rahul's case uh, i think uh, the main point that worked in the patient's favor was that as discussed earlier it was a tongue type fracture which is more amenable to uh, reconstruction at a later stage uh, and that uh, the other thing was there was there was not that much significant depression which is more of a rotational component of the fracture that was there i think you did a really good job opposing the did that back to its original position and i think that's what worked in this patient favor it was if it was like a comminuted uh, more of a depression type of fracture then that would have not been that amenable to this kind of reconstruction at this stage yes. so i think that's what maybe worked in that favor thank you kamal please 
So, uh, you know, one thing we should bear in mind that all the calcaneal reconstructions which we do, even at two weeks or three weeks, and there is a paper in which at the time of reconstruction, they have taken the samples of the cartilage of the posterior facet, and they found anywhere between 20% to 30% cellular death taking place even at two to three weeks. So we expect that by six months, the cellular depth would have increased to a much larger level. So basically, we are just in doing these kind of reconstructions, and that too in Indian scenario, you know, it's a big risk because patient, once it fails, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't say that it failed because we've attempted. He says because it was done and it has failed. So it's better that you must have in writing a consent from a patient that there is a high probability of this kind of a reconstruction still continuing to give you pain because of the arthritis which is going to supervene. And yes, of course, the bigger the size of the fragment which you're lifting in late reconstructions, the better our chances. So I think uh, the patient did well because there was a big fragment which was lifted and which was put back into position. So that's all I have to add. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sir, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sir, can I ask a question to Rahul? Yeah, please. Uh, in such cases, do, would you like to counsel your patients that uh, if on the table you find that the articular cartilage is not good enough, you should go ahead with the uh, fusion right at that point because the, you may not get the right impression on the CT scan. What is actually the status of the cartilage? Yes. yes. Only when you open, you find it out that, that it, it is gone. Then uh, if, was it like that you uh, wanted to counsel your patient? Before? Yes, sir. She was counseled regarding this. I did explain it to her that if I see that cartilage is not at all in a shape of being, you know, uh, to be salvaged, I would do a primary, I would do a fusion uh, right there. But since, as I said, the patient was absolutely uh, not willing for a fusion, she, she blatantly said that if there is a 1% chance of saving the joint, do it. So, so I just wanted to convey that we should keep this in mind, you know, when you're doing such This was after I have done this case, and uh, uh, there is not a very long follow-up. Probably like the video is four months post-op. Now it's been like six months post-op, and patient has not yet come, been able to come because of the COVID for the scans. And uh, we are yet to see what are the implications, probably like two years or three years or five years down the line, how long the joint can continue to perform in a good way. So that's why this is much more open discussion we can have here. At, uh, right. Great job. Thank you, Thank you Rahul. Uh, 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 Pradeep, you have a, uh, made a quick comment, please. Yeah. So just on the facectomy, how much facet you can remove? And I think if you look at uh, Stephen and Sandra's classification, Sander, when he said the, the tight one, he said was uh, you could do, so he said only lateral wall exostectomy. And also, when you do that exostectomy, lateral wall arthritis, he, you can literally take a 25 to 30% joint off as, as long as the joint is stable. And you already rightly said, I think as long as 70% of the joint is normal and load bearing is good, I think you can easily sacrifice it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, before we go to uh, uh, Dr. Gurunath, uh, there is an article and there is a study by uh, Guang Rong Yu and Stephen Ramelton group. These two studies are there on to uh, uh, osteotomy for malunited uh, uh, tongue type depression uh, fracture. And they have said that beyond eight months post injury, the results are universally bad. That is what is their observation. The study was done in 2016 and 2017. Okay, over to uh, Dr. Gurunath for your case. Please start sharing your screen. Thank you, sir. Can you able to see my screen? Yeah, you can. First of all, I thank FS. Indian Foot and Ankle Society for giving me an opportunity to present this case. So this is very interesting case uh, done in 2016 when I was about to start my career as a foot and ankle surgeon. So 40 years male presented to me. He was non 
smoker, non-diabetic. He presented with two years old malunited calcaneal fracture. There was a history of fall from height. Then he went to an orthopedic surgeon uh, and uh, below knee slab was given. Then he lost the follow-up and he went to quacks and there was history of massage. So he presented with me pain in while walking, difficulty while walking. On examination, there was tenderness all over lateral aspect of the ankle joint. Clinically, there was a gross heel varus. So these are the preoperative x-rays. You can see there is a very well appreciated heel varus with some sort of rotation. And you can compare on the normal side that is right side. So if you see the axial view, on the right side, you can see the normal heel, and this is left side. See the amount of heel varus, and uh, there is a component of rotation also. So I uh, discussed with the patient, and I told him that he will need surgery, and he may land up in subtalar fusion also. But he was not ready. So I discussed with him. And then I decided to do lateral closing calcaneus osteotomy, bring back the tuberosity back and see the condition of the subtalar joint, whether it is okay or whether he will need the fusion. So on table, this is the lateral oblique x-ray is uh, oblique uh, incision taken. And I decided to take a wedge according to the Elizabeth principle that the, at the core of the uh, deformity, I took the tracings and it was about 1.2 centimeters of lateral closing wedge. So I took the wedge and uh, with the help of 2K wires, then I closed the osteotomy. These are the intraoperative C arm pictures you can see. And I could do the uh, remarkable correction on table. The surgery done on fifth. 10, 2016, he was on slab for six weeks, non weight bearing for three months. He was all right for almost one year. And after one year, I did the screw removal procedure and then he lost the follow up. And he came and this is the post op x-ray you can see. And retrospectively, when I think there was some sort of residual virus is there and some rotational component was there. So patient came to me after two years and he was having pain while walking after long hours. He was a farm worker. So then I took the CT scan, probably some sort of early arthritic changes were there and some residual virus deformity and some sort of uh, exostasis remaining. And this was the follow-up x-ray after two years after the CC screw removal. So these are his complaints. So this is X-ray on 10-11-2018. Then he lost the follow-up. I said he will need surgery, probably subtalar fusion, but wait and watch for one year, six, six months to one year. So suddenly he disappeared and again came back after three months with severe pain while walking, discharging sinus from the lateral aspect. And when I asked him, he told he got operated for second surgery uh, outside on 27th November 2018. That is almost two hours from the first surgery. And unfortunately, he developed some subclinical infection and severe pain. So this was the x-ray when he presented to me. So this is the screw and some lytic lesions in the talus and the subtalar joint. So I told him we have to remove the screw and wait till the infection subsides. Then I did all the blood investigations, CT and MRI. You can see the CT also. There are some infection changes. This is the MRI. Also shows some subtalar joint involvement, probably the anterior facet. Then I told him, remove the screw, control of the infection, wait and watch. And then finally, he will need subtalar fusion. Then I planned the third surgery and I posted him for the subtalar fusion. I took the extensile approach. I did lateral bumpectomy. There was a lot of fibrous tissue, probably post-infection. And on table, I thought I could, uh, there is some residual heel virus. So I did the calcaneus lateral uh, osteotomy and I 
de rotate the calcaneus and try to pull the posterior tuberosity at the normal position and i did this subtalar fusion with two screws so this is the uh, clinical photograph before the final surgery so this was the first surgery when i did the lateral closing wedge calcaneal ostomy this is the second incision he had done outside and this is the third incision that is the lateral extensile approach so these are the intra clinical pictures you can appreciate that there was still some residual heel varus was there and this was the apex you can see here so this is the x ray after one year after the final subtalar fusion so the now patient these are the clinical photographs patient is fine this is the final clinical photograph so to summarize patient has got four surgeries first is only calcaneal osteotomy second is removal of the cc screw the third surgery is removal of the screw due to some infection and the final surgery is subtalar fusion along with the calcaneal osteotomy so some questions still remaining in my mind what could have been done better in this case on day 1 that is one is there any still any residual varus remaining or any rotational component is remaining so these are the questions to the panels and the seniors thank you very much thank you dr gurunath excellent case presentation uh, i would uh, like professor uh, if you could put your x rays of last final post operative x rays if you could put and yes, uh, uh, may i ask pro, uh, dr tom lee to uh, come up with your comments on to this case yeah i there there are two questions that i have in my mind is why did he have continued pain did he have continued pain because the heel tuberosity was still in varus or did he have continued pain because he had some element of subtalar arthritis post traumatic and obviously in your final operation you fix both you did a revision of the tuberosity osteotomy and you fuse the subtalar joint so we don't know but to learn from the case i, I i'm trying to figure out which it is and in my mind my conclusion is the heel tuberosity is that what might have been done better is at the very first operation if you had a more aggressive osteotomy with a little bit more derotation may, maybe he would have avoided abnormal stress on the subtalar joint and never needed any of the others but in the end when you watch him walk you certainly have accomplished the goal of getting him back to full function okay. professor go your comments Can you hear me, Rajiv? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Lovely. Hi. Yeah. So I think I think that's a that's a phenomenal case, and I think the the message that we're getting very clearly is that calcaneal malunion typically may involve multiple procedures. Hopefully, uh, fewer the better. But you know, it's not unusual uh, that they end up having multiple procedures. Um, so I, I completely echo what uh, what Tom says, but I'll, I'll expand a little bit more. So this is a 40-year-old guy who's a farmer uh, who came in two years after his original injury with a varus heel, and I would suspect even you know not having the video of him walking on day one, I suspect he probably already had midfoot rotation and forefoot rotation uh, as a result of this of this varus deformity. so a hind foot driven four foot deformity uh which he's been compensating for and walking on uh which may or may not have resulted in a significant component of his pain so when he has his first operation and he can be and the surgeon rotates his heel to try and correct the heel it's just as important to address the midfoot and four foot sequence
hyperbole that have resulted from this deformity over a period of two years. Now, it may be that the reason why the pain continued uh, after the first operation is because the joint, the subtalar joint, wasn't quite fully aligned by just the rotation, by just the heel osteotomy because of the midfoot and the forefoot deformity. And so the pain, therefore, as Tom said, progressed. And now you have a issue where the subtalar joint is partly the pain generator and the heel bearer's deformity, though it may have been corrected, the rest of the foot composite deformities haven't been addressed. And so the pain continues as a result of that. So my message, Rajiv, would be that when you have a chronic deformity like this in the hind foot, it's very important to address the residual compensatory bearers in the midfoot and the forefoot as well in trying to restore the plantigrade foot. Addressing the calcaneal malunion in isolation may not necessarily resolve the pain uh, that, has, that has been caused by, by the original injury. So very well said, Gaw. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, you want to add something? You want to ask something? Pradeep, you have to unmute yourself. Correct. I, I did that. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so so I don't know if uh, Gurunar, I think this is an ex uh, exciting and a very, very thorough presentation of a, uh, and, uh, and especially in India where we know the fact that patients get lost to follow up for um, uh, after three months or so. I think uh, Gurunath has a very fantastic follow up this patient. Um, only thing is, as I said before, all calcaneal malunion need to be investigated. I know in the axial view, you just see a little bit of hind foot or the calcaneal tuberosity. Yes. But I would get a CT scan done. And if it shows a little bit of arthritis, I would not hesitate to get an MRI. As Gao has already said, he already had an element of arthritis at that time. And if at that time we would have had better information, I would have taken an extended lateral approach and probably corrected the hind foot rotation and the hind foot deformity much better. And if it was only mild arthritis, I would have said the joint um, uh, uh, in a better way, I would say. A uh, rest, I think Gurunath has done very well, um, finally getting an excellent result for this patient. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Dr. Kamal, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, as has been pointed out, the radiological analysis or understanding the pathoanatomy was not complete in the first day. So in all such cases of malunion who are presenting after more than eight or nine months, they must go for a CT scan because the three dimensions which are available in CT will only tell us how exactly is the deformity. Second thing, the pain generator. Once the patient complains of pain and you are not able to understand what is the pain generator on a clinic basis in a you can do these differential injections to understand, is the pain being contributed by the Chopard joint, by calcaneo cuboid joint? And then you have a better analysis, you know, that probably the secondary arthrosis of the Chopard joint has set in due to persistent virus deformity. And then another, another guideline which I would say, with such severe uh, virus deformities, it is best to do them in a prone position because in prone position, you can see whether your varus is getting corrected or not. This Doing these procedures in the lateral position and giving a lateral incision only uh, is really deceptive, you know, to understand whether you have been able to correct the deformity or not. Okay. Uh, Dr. Maninda? Rajiv, yeah. sorry, can yeah. I just make a very quick comment? Yeah, please, please. Uh, I just throwing in uh, just to stir up a little bit of a discussion. Can I just ask the panelists uh, talking about pain generators? Does anyone uh, routinely do selective injections uh, in this kind of a problem where we are not entirely sure often clinically exactly where the pain is coming from? Yes, in my so series I... of in my series of sixty five cases of calcaneus malunion, I've done multiple injections uh, which are siam uh, siam uh, guided, guided or uh, guided by ultrasonography yes you wanted to add something uh, kamal yes yeah, so differential injections uh, are required when 
you know, you have an equivocal situation. You have a calcaneocuboid pain clinically, but you want to save the lateral column. You want to retain the mobility of the lateral column. But at the same time, you want to take away the pain. So that's when they come to your rescue. So can I add something, sir? Yes, Dr. Vora, followed by Dr. Maninder. And then we uh, will move to next case. So we have been talking about the pain generators in this case. But this patient has been in virus for around about two years. Why not we think ankle as a pain generator? Because this there is a constant medial loading on the ankle also so, uh, for two years. So I just want to share that we should keep an eye on the ankle also on these cases of the virus load. That's what I want to add. Yeah. Maninder? Yeah. I would agree that, you know, the alteration of biomechanics is the cause here. And... Uh, the thing here that we need to really examine clinically, and I think the diagnosis is more clinical as well, is that whether there were actually any subtilar movements left at two years with that significant deformity. And if there were not any subtilar movements initially to start off with, then uh, doing a joint sparing operation would have been, you know, not a long-term solution. Uh, and that's what, what I would say that, you know, we, if, if there are any subtilar movements available, then we can, and then which are pain free, then I think we can think of joint sparing. Otherwise, we would be, we should be more aggressive in correcting the deformity as well as fusing the joint at the same time. Uh, so, doing an in situ fusion plus a calcaneal osteotomy would have been the first choice, possibly, if there were no subtle movements in that. But I would. Okay. So, thank you, panel. And now, may I ask uh, Dr. Parthiban to start with his case presentation? Thank you, Dr. Gurunath. And Dr. Parthiban, you, can you start sharing your screen, please? So there was one question. Did you get it from Dr. Kalmakar? How you assess the distraction? Okay. So uh, yeah. uh, maybe, Gurunath, this is the uh, question to you. How is the amount of distraction of subtalar joint you assess uh, when you're doing a distraction uh, uh, tallow calcaneal fusion? Okay, any, any of the panel member would like to answer this question, Kamal? Yes, so if you look at the, the Kalo first metatarsal axis, that's your best guide, you know, in the lateral view. So you've got to get back when you put a lamina spreader between these posterior facet of the talus and the calcaneus, start looking at the correction of the Kalo first metatarsal axis. And that's the best indicator you know where to stop. You should either get them close to zero, maybe around five, uh, not less, not more than five at when by the time you stop distracting. Yeah. Dr. Rao, uh, Dr. Rao, so far as so far as I am concerned, I always take standing weight-bearing X-ray of the opposite side, which gives me an idea of the calcaneal pitch as well as tallow calcaneal angle. And that is also one of the factor which I consider why I do a distraction cal cal tallow calcaneal fusion. Uh, I think we go to Dr. Parthiban. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I hope you, everybody can see my screen. Yes, yes. go ahead. Yes, sir. So first I thank the Indian Foot and Ankle Society for giving this opportunity to present this case. So it is a case of a 35 years man, three years old malunited fracture calcaneum treated with a native splints and came to me after three years only. He came with a pain in the lateral aspect of the, uh, just below the fibula. That was his complaint when he came to me, that was his complaint. So in this, when we did it, his bolus angle was just 14 degrees. And this is critical angle of Gusein was 155. And I did a, I just wanted to, because I can feel the bump on the lateral aspect. So I just did a weight bearing X-ray of the ankle, which showed that there is an impingement on the lateral malleolus as well. This was his clinical photograph. Sorry, this was a little dull. Actually, the you can see the left side, which is broadened there. And then went ahead with a sinostasic approach. When I exposed the joint, I did a bumpectomy through this itself, just to make sure the bump is not impinging on the lateral malleus as well. Then went ahead, used a distractor to see the joint surface. 
this was so much of uh, this thing after debridement and everything took a tricortical iliac graft places there fixed it with a couple of screws this is 6 months post operative period it went on to heal well the patient didn't had any pain or anything went on to heal well this was the pre op and the post op bullous angle as well as this uh, pre op and post op critical angle of gusain thank you i think it was a very short <laughs> this thing presentation oh thank you very much we just wanted this kind of presentation only now <laughs> again the same question uh, how did you intraoperatively judged about the amount of lengthening you want to do so uh, as how the discussion went on it was for the mid axis of the talus and the first metatarsal but that time i i just had the opposite side ankle just to for a comparison sir intraoperatively i just compared with that but this angle that i didn't see it during that period this this case i would have done it almost 5 6 years back i did it so uh, I, i don't think i would have uh, done it with that angle because i had a weight bearing x ray of the opposite limb for the ankle as well i had just to compare the impingement levels how it happened and this also i had a opposite limb for just for the comparison any other like compared with it yeah. any other approach you would have used mm, approach sir a- apart from a sinus tarsus yes. maybe a extensile lateral approach might have been little more helpful to take out the bump and everything sir oh. maybe because this was one of my older older day cases like 5 6 years back maybe if i do it now i may use a extensile lateral approach which could have been much easier for me now okay uh, are you happy with your uh, screws which you have used would you have used this kind of screws or you would have used a fully threaded screws so fully threaded screws i was not sure like uh, how much it is this, this gives a beautiful compression this is a differential screws that what i use regularly this uh, has a different pitch on the either side this gives a beautiful compression just the screws sometimes okay. in fact i've used a single screw also in these uh, not in this case some cases i've used a single screw also which gives a amazing compression you don't need to be worried sir this is a very nice one sir. this is from the extremity medical maninder would you have used fully threaded screws or partially threaded screw uh so uh yes if if once you got your uh, graft in uh the, it is automatically compressed so i would i would have used usually uh, what what i tend to do is to uh, put one single uh, a uh, compression screw initially and then a stabilizing screw non but usually at, uh, i would agree that you know i would put at least one compression screw and one uh, you know uh, as well as a single non compression screw as well a fully threaded and a partially threaded but i would use at least a, one partially threaded screw to hold that graft down but it has been shown that when you have a interpositional graft and the thread if if there's a thread in the graft then it holds that better in position so um, but i would agree at least one river to clipping okay yeah so kamal uh, your comments yeah so two things i always do i use divergent screws they are not usually parallel because we don't want the graft to collapse so one screw usually i also pass first one as a compression screw which you know sort of gives me a final position and maintains a good compression between all the surfaces which would bring a faster rate of healing or union and the second screw i would always use fully threaded so that the graft is maintained in that position and no further collapse is permitted yeah to uh, to more uh, clearly mention uh, uh, what i'll do i'll put a lateral screw first because i want to correct the varus that is going to be a compression screw partially threaded and the medial screw would be a position screw fully threaded and that would be in a divergent fashion like kamal said so one would go into body one would go into neck anyway uh, any comments dr pradeep on to this case any questions any comments 
so as i said as i said before i think in this you see uh, and uh, parthiban has kept this slide i would have definitely gone and i understand i have not been too critical of parthiban this would have been in the initial days but you can still see there is still a sub fibula impingement present i am not to be too critical but that's why i think if you get a first axial view and you see a large uh, lateral wall exhaust exhaustosis it is always better to open up uh, go through an extensive lateral approach you literally need to see the lateral part of your talus you need to excise this whole uh, bump from the lateral wall so the and probably take a tip of the fibula also some be, some studies have shown that you can, you may need to take that also to cor uh, to correct your sub fibula impingement and that bone you can flip over you can double it up and put it in your sub talar joint and that also gives a beautiful correction uh, rest i think everything looks fine uh, position of the screws and everything um in my few cases which i have shown we have valgus deformity so just do the other way around as dr rajiv shah said uh, dr parthiban there is a question yes, from sir. dr rao that were there any yes, wound issues if you uh, by use of this sinus star sai approach no sir i didn't had any because i commonly use this only for uh, nepo also for fixing a calcaneal fracture or uh, subtal effusion I, i have not had any issues sir maybe it takes a little longer to heal maybe because of the ooze sometimes as a mild ooze from the fracture site and all this but usually as per it it heals well sir unless and until if the patient is a smoker okay. i have had a issue with one patient who is a chronic smoker i burnt my fingers doing this calcaneum for that guy chronic smoker and uh, because the second post operatively the wound was looking amazing he was smoking on the third day in the room i just told him don't ever try doing it again but i don't know this guy kept on smoking and all got very yeah. bad what dr. bitter tom, experience i was yeah, thank you dr tom would you have taken a sinus star sai approach or a extensile uh, uh, lateral approach or a posterior approach for this case? Well, you read my mind uh, you know one of my favorite approaches is a posterior approach I like the posterior approach because it and it's just lateral to the Achilles tendon, so it's posterior lateral almost. I like the approach because the soft tissue envelope is excellent. Oftentimes there are other incisions laterally that I become very frightened, and with the posterior lateral approach, you have a very good view of the tip of the fibula, and it allows you to decompress it. You know, to it also allows me to fully distract. the subtalar joint which of course is compressed uh with laminar spreaders if i do not take down the achilles tendon typically i will distract the subtalar joint as much as possible which gives me a good idea of how much to elevate and how much bone graft that i need and through the posterior approach i have access to the posterior iliac crest where i can actually have much greater amount of bone than the anterior iliac crest. Uh I tend to prefer uh fully threaded screws because I believe that my inner position graft is already under compression and I want to make sure that there's no risk of subsidence after I close up and allow the patient to walk um at that point. So, I this is a great case. One one other point I want to make and why this is a great case is it avoids a lot of the mistakes younger junior orthopedic surgeons make and that is to fuse it in situ you so it's so easy to go in and say let me just do the exostectomy get rid of the impingement and fuse it in situ you and this demonstrates why that doesn't work you have to get it out to length not only for the decompression because the decompression occurs through the entire motion of the ankle but the other is of course on a young guy like this is to restore the mechanical advantage of the Achilles tendon so this looks like a simple case it's a simple case cuz he did you did everything correctly and didn't fall into any of the traps thank you tom thank you, uh, there are two problems which i have noticed with the posterior approach is one a uh, removal of complete lateral wall exostosis because sometimes you are really not able to see that whether you removed adequately the lateral wall exostosis or not that's one thing and second thing reposition of the peroneal tendons into the normal position and recreation of the superficial peroneal retinaculum 
this with the posture approach i have found little problematic uh, maybe you could enlighten us on to this you're cor you're correct rajiv it's very difficult to see the excess doses the way you do on an extensile or on a sinus tarsi but i will make the argument that it's much better to feel it so you can stick your finger in there and you can feel that impingement now in regards to the perineal tendon through the posterior approach, I address the perineals in the same way I do in the extensile, and that is as a full tissue cuff. So since I stay directly on the periosteum, stay directly on the bone, I elevate the whole thing as one sleeve. And so all of the benefits and the risks of doing that is exactly the same as an extensile because it's under one sleeve. So my recommendation is have confidence in the tip of your finger and then uh, do what your finger tells you to do. And again, to repeat myself, it allows me to put my finger in there and take the whole ankle through a range of motion, which is the advantage of the posterior approach. You can see the dynamic impingement that occurs. Great point. Uh, Pro Dr. Go, followed by Dr. Vora, uh, for quick comments, please. Um, I just want to, uh, to, to just go back to the case, really. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, we've, so we've talked about pain generators in the last case, and this patient came in with, uh, with purely lateral-sided impingement pain and absolutely no anterior pain whatsoever. Um, now, there is some data out there that talks about the, the risk of non-unions uh, and even delayed unions with interposition grafts. So is there an argument here uh, to do a uh, somewhat uh, a lateral bumpectomy uh, and just an inside to fusion. I know Tom has said that that's the, that's the wrong thing to do, but this patient had no weakness of push off. He had no anterior pain whatsoever. He only had lateral sided pain. Uh, and given the risk of non union or delayed union, is there an argument to do an inside to fusion? Because I know there's data from Myson and from Roger Atkins to say that, you know, putting grafts in uh, is, is a concern and they don't heal as well, uh, especially in patients who have no anterior impingement pain. We are trying to restore radiological alignment, but they don't necessarily correlate with functional improvement. Just, just being devil's advocate. Yeah. So, no, uh, no. I, I, okay, so let's get into a discussion on that. <laughs> so I, I agree. And that's why I said the easy way is to do the bumpectomy and to do it in situ. And I do yeah. think anterior pain or anterior impingement is the uh, indication for really trying to elevate it. Let me make one other point. So I, I, I think there is a good argument for that. What I like about this case is that it was autogenous iliac crest cramp. So when you look at the non-union rates, of uh, distraction uh, arthrodesis, including Myerson's, most of those were allografts, and those non-union rates were very high, 10 to 30 percent. There's been some series of almost 50 percent. I feel that when the, that the the problem, as I said, with the bumpectomy and in situ, is that even though the bumpectomy, excessectomy, sufficiently decompresses the pressure on the tip of the fibula and the perineal and the sural nerve is that it's a static decompression and that many of my patients have continued nagging pain laterally, even though I decompressed it. And so my preference is the distraction because I really get the joint out and allow that to do it. And when you do that, I do think an iliac crest graft is important. Okay. Can I ask one question to Tom, sir? Rajiv Shah, sir? Yeah, go ahead, Pradeep. <clears throat> Um, so, you, uh, uh, Tom, you mentioned about the posterior distraction, how difficult or easy it is to put a trapezoidal type of a graft when you are doing your either a varus or a valgus uh, correction, um, visually to put a trapezoidal graft in the post through the posterior part. We know the fact from the extensile approach, you can easily do it. You can actually see the whole graft. You can actually see the whole correction, but posteriorly, I would actually maintain it's easier posteriorly than laterally because you see the full width of the subtalar joint and you can control it because you, I have 
two laminar spreaders in there. I have one medial, I have one oh, lateral, wow. and I do variable elements. And I, I will say, Prady, you know, for all of us who are doing much more complicated hind foot arthrodesis and, and failures, uh, like ankle replacements, become comfortable with the posterior approach because the visualization is terrific. And again, for the younger members of the audience who may go in there posteriorly for the first time, you will be shocked with two things. You will be shocked with how deep that incision is. It is really far away from the Achilles tendon. And number two, you will be shocked with the amount of rotation, the rotation of what the ankle joint is, because it is really rotated. But once you become comfortable with that, oh, and then the third is, make sure you know the difference between the subtalar joint and the ankle joint because it's separated by, <laughs> by a centimeter. So once you get over those three things, you will fall in love with the posterior approach. Sure. Okay, sure. thank you very thank much, you. great discussion. And the next case is also going to elaborate on to what we discussed. So over to you, Abhishek Jain. Thank you, sir. Uh, Can you share your screen, please? Yeah, yes. what's it? Am I audible? Yes, go ahead. Uh, is my screen seen by all? Yes, seen, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, thank you for all the wishes and blessings that all you have bestowed on me. And thank you, IFAS, for the opportunity to present this case. So I start the case. Um, this is a 60 years old lady, fall from height seven months back, sustained left calcaneal fracture, treated with cast, comes to me with the pain on lateral aspect of hind foot on walking, with intermittent swelling. Pain is also there, a very diffuse kind, but mostly whenever I ask, where is the pain? She puts her finger at the subfibular area. So what we can see here on the X-ray, there is arthritic, there is obliteration of the gizane and the bolus angle. There is a lateral bump on the heel. Overall, the coronal deformity is not there. The, there is no varus valgus as such. On examination, there is no coronal plane deformity. Subfibular tenderness is there. Subtalar range of motion is minimal, just a jog with pain. Ankle range of motion, dorsiflexion is up to neutral, and she is able to squat without any difficulty, pain, or impingement. She is a countryside lady, and uh, squatting is something which she requires. Now, if you look at that talar inclination here, we would appreciate that there is a loss of height of the calcaneus. But at the same time, squatting is all right. So I would like to, okay, I first finish my case. So my diagnosis was calcaneal malunion with subtalar arthritis, lateral wall exostosis, and subfibular impingement, ramel type 1. And my plan was lateral wall exhaustectomy with subfibular decompression and subtalar fusion. Uh, uh, I take the opportunity to give a disclaimer. <clears throat> I didn't have an intra-op photograph, so I've taken the intra-op photograph from Dr. Kamal Dureja sir. So my position, intra-op position, was lateral decubitus. Incision was lateral extensile. My steps was first subfibular decompression subtalar joint preparation and fixation of subtalar joint with 6.5 cc screw. And these were my final uh, x-rays. Patient is still on follow-up, six months post-op. She is comfortable and the lateral pain is gone. No complaints. That's all, thank you. So I have not done any distraction arthrodesis for her because she didn't have any anterior problem pain or impingement. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Goh, uh, there is someone uh, who is supporting mm -hmm. your viewpoint. Your comments. Then comments no, no, no. Tom. <laughs> uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll make mine short. Rajiv, I, I don't want, I don't want the audience to go away with the, with the notion or the idea that a distraction arthritis is a bad thing. Uh, our, all our, uh, what I wanted to point out was that uh, it needed to be done well, and it needed to be done for the, for the correct indication. I think with this lady, it's the, the, the key thing that I would be concerned about in a 60-year-old who is seven months post-injury and has what seems like subtalar joint pain uh, is alignment. So I would be very careful. I know you said there's no heel varus or no heel valgus, but she's 60, and I would want to be very, very sure and meticulous that her, uh, either her Saltzman view or her heel uh, bolus angle, or even better still, a weight-bearing CT. That's what I would do in my practice to make sure that her mechanical axis is normal. And if there's any doubt at all uh, with the mechanical axis, I wouldn't hesitate to do a calcaneal osteotomy with the subtalar fusion. All because these x-rays are weight-bearing, what you're saying. Sorry? All these x-rays are weight-bearing. Sure. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is the, it's the coronal view. Uh, that I would be worried about. So if she has any kind of, if she has any kind of malalignment either in the tibia or, or in the ankle joint, uh, which is resulting in the subtalar pain and not just purely from the trauma per se, I would want to address that as well at the same time. Otherwise, she at 60, she's going to have a risk of, you know, ongoing pain as a result. And then you'd realize that it's actually not all coming from the subtalar joint. It's actually coming from the other joint because of a mechanically unsound uh, extremity. So that's what I would say. I would say it's alignment, alignment, alignment. But as far as the technical execution and the choice of procedure, uh, I think I think it's, it's well done. I, w I wouldn't do anything different. Well, I think this is a perfect example of why Dr. Gao is so smart and he's correct. <laughs> So this is a great example of where an in situ fusion works well. I think the test that you used, the squatting test, was a wonderful test since she had no pain squatting. And so I certainly can't um, fault you for an in situ fusion on this. I will also add to Dr. Gao's point about the coronal line uh, alignment. Take a look at this x-ray. If you look at the Saltzman view, the heel is still in varus. So if you look to the left and look at the lateral, which is not weight bearing, you can still see that there appears to be a slight cavus view, right? Mary's angle is positive and the metatarsals are stacked. Again, it's non weight bearing. And so I think everything that uh, Professor Gao just said is true and it is something we should keep an eye on as she recovers. So I agree with him. So can I add something, sir? Dr. Shah, can I add something? He's rejoining. You can continue, sir. Uh, uh, there's a one question uh, to Abhishek. Yes, that uh, uh, he says that uh, heel was uh, you could get only up to neutral the ankle, and even then yeah. the patient could sweat. Was yeah. actually she decompensating by you know moving at the knee or something like that? It is very difficult to have a full squatting and you can move only knee up uh, uh, ankle up to neutral. No, no I, what I, I, I what I meant was that when I did a passive dorsiflexion of the ankle, yeah. I could bring up to the neutral. Only neutral. She, That's what yeah. I'm saying. But she could That's squat. What... She could squat That's without uh, lifting her heel. She could squat with full heel down. So I, I, maybe. Why do you th why do you think that's possible, Abhishek? Because uh, you should have almost twenty yes. degrees of dorsiflexion to squat. To, to squat. Yeah, that's yeah. what squat. I mean. Yeah. How yeah. can you squat with when your ankle is going just to ninety degrees? That is what I I, I have my reservation. That's what I wanted to. Do. Uh, I believe maybe uh, because uh, she was she was trying to resist me maybe, but the, my basic uh, uh, final litmus test was whether she can squat or not. So she could do that. So I thought that no, doing I, the distraction... I, I, I also use this test always. Huh. When I'm doing, uh, I always ask the patient to squat when I'm getting a, a case of malunion of uh, uh, calcaneus because this is a one wonderful test by which you can uh, just rule out ankle impingement. But most of the time I see if they can or they have ankle and they cannot squat. This is my experience. I don't know about uh, the others, if they have uh, witnessed such things.
things in their clinical practice. And so many a times they compensate by lifting their heel. So I was pretty yeah, yeah, much that, sure. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I was very much sure that she is not lifting okay. her heel. So that's the that's why the procedure. Okay. Okay. Uh, may I may I say something, please? Yeah. Sure. Sure. So there are certain objective criteria. There are certain subjective criteria. There are objective criteria. And I think when we are talking of science, we have to be objectively also very clear as to what we are dealing. So have the lateral view weight bearing for both the sides and calculate the tenor first metatarsal axis bilaterally. Some people are known to have about 10 degree Mary angle bilaterally. So this could be the reason that even after, you know, not having this tallow metatarsal axis to zero degree, she has a fairly good range of ankle motion. Yes, so yes, yes, compare yes, yes. with yeah. the new to normal side and then yeah. probably yeah. proceed accordingly. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, can I say something? Sure. Yes, sure. Yeah. sure. Uh, Great. The Taylor declination. Uh, so do we have a consensus that if there is no signs of anterior impingement clinically, but the x-ray shows that there is loss of calcaneal height along with the reduced Taylor declination, which is not allowing the ankle to move beyond neutral, that we still not, don't need to do a distraction orthodesis. We don't need to restore the calcaneal height. And if the patient's symptoms are only lateral, then we can just get away with an exostectomy and an in situ fusion. Is that the consensus? Or I think uh, that because that's the point that's being made here at the moment. But is that, you know, because I would tend to think that restoring the biomechanics is, is still important, that we need to restore the height of the calcaneum uh, and restore the tailor declination, even though the symptoms may not be that acute. As long as, the, you know, the anterior, the dorsiflexion is restricted, I think we need to think of uh, restoring that. But I may be the devil's advocate again. Yeah. So uh, I would like the opinion of uh, Gao and uh, Tom. If, what What do you think? Uh, I'll go first. So I I, I I would start off by saying that um, it's it's a it's not an easy easy decision because I think when when we come to restoring the biomechanics, often with this kind of situation, I find that when we do a distraction arthrodesis. Uh, and you restore the radiological correction, um, and your and the Achilles leverage, lever arm, as it were, is is better restored. Uh, the patient tends to function better, but I think it really comes down to the patient selection. If we are 100% sure that there's absolutely no anterior pain at all, the patient has no muscle deficit at all, then um, the my my question is, if the arthrodesis is done and the patient then goes into a non-union, and I've had a few of those cases. Uh, one that's question then, well, if I'd done this differently, uh, would the results have been different? So I don't think the consensus is that we we should not do distraction arthrodesis if the patient has no anterior impingement pain. Uh, I think the, the better consensus would be that if we're going to do a distraction arthrodesis, we should do it well. So we know that certain sorts of things don't work very well. For example, uh, as, as Tom has said, allografts uh, have a higher risk of non-union. We don't express the joint adequately, medial and lateral. I tend to do medial incisions and lateral incisions if I'm trying to correct the alignment and get the arthrodesis right. Sometimes I even use a, a medial a distractor uh, to make sure that I don't over tilt it. Um, and I think correcting, making sure that the Achilles length is also restored, uh, I think is very important. So I think, I think that's more of the consensus rather than saying we shouldn't be doing distraction arthrodesis. Tom, okay. over to you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Tom, you want to do some comment? Or there's a question for Dr. Abhishek. Uh, no, Dr. Sir, Dr. Rajiv, Rajiv, sir. Rajiv, sir. Can, can uh, I, I, Tom I want take to that question? Add to Dr. Gao's comments before we get to the question. Because when I look at my fellows or my orthopedic residents, their natural inclination is, of course, to be lazy. And so they, <laughs> the natural inclination is, I want to do the in situ fusion and the exostectomy because it's easy. I think the approach is actually, I want to do the distraction and let me find compelling reason not to do the distraction and to do the in situ. So if I had to look at my practice, about 80% of the cases similar to this would get a distraction with an autograph. 
when I find compelling reasons not to do it, and this case had very good compelling reasons. One, it had an excessectomy. The lateral wall was a little bit of a buckle and it wasn't a full blowout. So there really was a sharp peak that looked like it was impinging. And number two, she had a very excellent squat test and she was able to squat. So she had two compelling reasons not to do it and subsequently it became successful. But the case previous, even though they did not have anterior impingement pain, the anatomy was different. And so there was a typical case where it had a great deal of impingement. It wasn't a simple excess dosis. It was a whole wall that was buckled. And so there, the natural inclination was to do the distraction. Okay, thank you. And now this brings us to the next case. Uh, 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 before I hand it over to Indrajit, uh, there's a question that do you do gastrocnemius release, Abhishek, in such cases? Or when do you do gastrocnemius release for a distraction fusion? Abhishek. Sir, uh, till date, I have not done any gastroc release for uh, any of the calcanean malunion fusion. Okay. Uh, the answer to that is that if the case is quite old and you are really struggling to get the length, I have done gastrocnemius recession many times in long-standing calcaneous small union. Okay, over to you, Indrajit, for your presentation. Right, sir. Yeah. Abhishek, you need to sh uh, stop sharing. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not sharing. Um, in the jeet has already shared. Yes. Okay, thank you. In beginning the case, uh, so this was a one year old malunited calcanium. It is basically an open fracture. I have left the video. So it was managed conservatively at his place in West Bengal and he had infection. This was a CT scan after one year. So you can see the whole blowout there. There's bone loss. The 3D reconstruction view, the flattening. <clears throat> this is a small video, a clinical video. So you can see it's fixed there. This was the incision which was taken, reop markings. See the heel was fixed in aversion. This was this normal position there. This on the medial side was a wound where there was an open fracture there. This was intra-op, the bone loss you can see. This was, it was filled with the allograft. Almost two centimeters of bone loss, the two centimeters of allograft was filled and a distraction arthrodis is done. This was the full dorsiflexion checked in the intra-op arm and the full plantar flexion checked. The k is put intra-op and two divergent screws put and distraction arthrodis is fused. This was the post-op clinical picture. The version was cleared and this was the final image. So I'll take it up for discussion. Yeah. So uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep, you have any comments on this fixation? Uh, if you can... Uh... Uh, put your style, uh, last slide in a shorter view, Indrajit. And Pradeep, please come up with your comments on to this case. Pradeep sir is not here, sir. Yeah, Pradeep. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Indrajit, if you could put your last images of your case. Yeah. We are seeing a very magnified view. I think, is that okay now? No, it's not okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay, go ahead. Pradeep. So I think the hind foot, hind foot alignment is quite good. So there's no varus or valgus, but I'm not happy with two things. One is the amount of distraction which you have got because the talus is still almost horizontal. I would want to see a more inclined talus and the Meary's angles if you would have it a much better way. That's the first part. And the second is... Um, I probably had some lag, but I did not see actually a proper iliac crest bone graft as a block, a trapezoidal block I would put in. That really gives my distraction to the 
a subtalar joint. Third, uh, the fixation. Um, it is almost starting at one point of, uh, at a single point from the posterior tuberosity and diverging. I would have wanted to have two different starting points. Um, get one really one or two into the body and another screw coming from the anterior part of the calcaneum into the anterior, almost like the tailor's neck, um, uh, coming from the anterior part of the calcaneum to the anterior part of the tailor's. That's what I would have done a, a fixation. Uh, that's what I would have done it. Thank you. Dr. Tom, your comments, your guidance to this youngster. You know, I, I, I have a very uh, little comments. I'm looking at the x-rays and I agree that um, it does not appear that um, it's been, um, the talus has been restored back. It still looks flat, but other than that, I, I'm pleased with the fixation and I'm, I'm glad there's graft in there. I, I wish I could have gotten more height, but sometimes you're limited in what you can do. Yeah, uh, Kamal? Your comments, your advices. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, somebody, okay. Is it fine? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So if we go back to the CT scans, the primary goal before correcting these malunion is to study your CT scans well. And you have to study your same way the way we do the classification in Saunders and we look at the coronal view with the broadest coronal view with the broadest view of the calcaneus you know that's that's the one view which will really guide us so you have to look at that view <laughs> and then see what all you are facing you know you are able to see the varus you are able to see the subfibular impingement in that view or maybe in one of one or two more anterior or posterior views and then your goals have to be clear because you have to first list your pathoanatomies as Pradeep said very well, pathoanatomy. So unless you have your pathoanatomies listed, you probably will miss out doing one thing or the other. So in all the presentations, if the viewers, if the young doctors, they are first listing the pathoanatomies and then telling us how step-by-step step they dealt with those pathoanatomies, and then probably the everybody who is a new to the malunion will understand it well, and that's how also the error would reduce in correcting these malunions. Quick comments by Go, followed by his presentation. With uh, with a lateral wall. Uh, blowout or more, a small degree of a lateral wall blowout and, and joint depression with tailor declination that's been restored well. Um, I mean, this is an x ray that's non weight bearing. Um, so, a little bit hesitant to comment on the final position of the, of the tailors and the foot. So, I've got, I've got nothing more to say on that, really. Okay. So, you could go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Uh, can you stare your screen? Can you see it, Rajiv? Yeah, yes. we can see it. Yep. Yes, we can see. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I just I just put together a few cases uh, just to highlight some, some points. Actually, to be fair, a lot of them have been discussed already. I'll just go through them very quickly uh, because I know we, we're sort of coming towards the end and we'll probably take some questions and comments uh, sort of the, at the end. So uh, this is, uh, I, I put this up to begin. Uh, which is just kind of a story that shows that uh, uh, calcaneal fractures are really uh, a spectrum. So this is an open calcaneus with a medial-sided wound, dislocated TN joint and displaced tuberosity. Um, and this is another guy who's a construction worker in, uh, in, a, in a shipyard, uh, treated slightly differently in an explosion. There was some thought about a non-operative treatment modality no, uh, to begin with. Uh, 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 yeah. That's, we are not seeing your screen, please. Uh, it's, okay. It's going, it's, going, so it's going fine. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah? Yeah, we can't see. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so this is the second case. 
something very similar to the first one. It's a construction worker who was, uh, who was involved in an explosion. There were some thoughts at the start whether we should be treating this non-operatively, uh, but he then underwent four sequential operations uh, and had almost five years of disability. And you can see the x-ray right at the bottom there. Uh, and I think most of us would agree that's really a questionable result if we actually really make him better. So I, I guess the, the, the thing that has come up time and time again about the role of a fusion, uh, how early we should do it, and what are the things that can accelerate uh, a fusion outcome. Uh, and, and certainly one of the things that we can agree on is the, the joint is very comminuted and cannot be reconstructed. And if you have other associated joint pathologies, then it's certainly worth considering a fusion. But my first message is that not all calcaneal fractures are the same, obviously, and therefore not all calcaneal male unions are the same. And I think one of the things that I, I, I kind of picked up as, as I went on and did more of these is that history and examination, I think is absolutely critical trying to identify the pain generator and what the patient's problem is uh, really sort of uh, dictates the algorithm. I, I kind of always compare uh, treatment of calcaneal malunions to a flat foot reconstruction. Uh, and I was always taught to write down the deformities in a flat foot on one column and have the surgical solutions to it on another column. Uh, and you would address the individual parameters of deformity with each surgical solution. And I think the way I kind of look at calcaneal malunions is, is the same. And that's why I find cal classifications, uh, certainly whether it's the ZWIP or the Romelt or even the, the, the Sanders one, not hugely useful uh, in terms of dictating treatment. So I just want to highlight a point uh, with a case illustration. It's a 47-year-old uh, involved in a road traffic accident. Uh, multiple different injuries, open fractures uh, as well. Um, and uh, he underwent a, a calcaneal fracture uh, fixation and IM nail of the tibia. I saw him about three, three and a half months uh, down the line. Uh, that's his nail in his tibia. Uh, and you can see pictures of the, uh, the calcaneal that was fixed uh, originally. So when I got to see him, it was just under four months. You can see the, uh, the bolus angle is, is lost. Um, and it's uh, virtually flat, but with a huge bump, huge massive bump underneath uh, the, the fibula with a lateral wall blowout. Uh, and that's the CT, which confirms that uh, subfibular uh, impingement with that uh, widened heel. Uh, and then seven months down the line, uh, he comes back to see me. He lives outside. Uh, he's, he's not native to Singapore. He's got a, a tibia that hasn't healed, uh, questionable at seven months. Uh, so he then goes back to his native country, has the tibia nail revised. The tibia then progresses to heal, uh, but he still complains of foot pain. The subtalar joint is painful, so he has the subtalar fusion done uh, in the same setting as having his tibial nail revised. Uh, and that was what's done. Uh, the tibia then goes on uh, to heal, but the picture on the right shows what was done for the subtalar fusion, uh, but that continues to be painful. Uh, he still has a non-union with lateral wall impingement. Uh, and that's partly because the alignment wasn't quite restored. Uh, and so I got to him uh, and uh, ended up having to shift the heel further, medialize the lateral side of the calcaneus, but also to reduce the subluxian joint uh, with a revision subtalar fusion. These are some II pictures uh, taken from the time uh, of the operation. He, I, I don't have the final pictures, uh, I'm afraid. So I think this, this, this case kind of illustrates this, the, the detrimental effects or the consequences of malalignment uh, to begin with. So the, my second message is that alignment should really be corrected at the earliest available opportunity. And that is really possibly at the time of the acute fracture uh, if possible. And if not, then it continues to come back uh, to haunt us. This is a 27-year-old construction worker with a close injury six months ago, heel and forefoot both in various. And we've kind of seen a similar case already, but this is slightly different. This patient, uh, so I ended up doing a calcaneal osteotomy and subtalar fusion, not truly appreciating the consequential effects on the midfoot and the forefoot. Five months down the line, his forefoot is still in supinatus. He continues to walk on the lateral border of his foot. 
Um, and so I come back and end, end up having to derotate the midfoot uh, onto the hind foot with, uh, at the level of the navicular cuneiform joint. So the late fusion, uh, we've talked about this already. I'm not going to dwell on this uh, uh, a lot, but you know, in trying to correct the alignment, restoring the height, reducing perineal compression, uh, I think these are amongst the goals of late fusion. Uh, in my practice, I would, I would do uh, more of a J rather than an L-shaped <clears throat> extensile incision. I find the flaps uh, easier, they heal better. Um, sinus palsy and a calcaneal osteotomy, I would do two incisions to try and address both. I wouldn't hesitate to do a medial and lateral incision. We've talked a lot about bone block or no bone block. I wouldn't dwell into that a lot. Uh, but I think patient selection is very important in trying to make that decision. Uh, when I'm doing a medial incision, I go down the bed of tip post standard uh, and through the deltoid ligament. It gives me better control of, of the heel in its correction and the shift. Uh, and a lateral incision would be two, it would be a lateral uh, oblique incision centered over the lateral wall, the calcaneus, and also one, the sinus tarsi to help me with the, uh, with the subtalar fusion. Uh, and this is an example of the type of shift uh, that you can achieve with the calcaneal osteotomy and trying to restore a mechanical axis uh, and then fixation with screws, headless screws, headless compression screws, and this is, this is what I typically use. Uh, and that's just an example of a tuber uh, that is in various and been shifted through the mid body of the calcaneus. Uh, and finally, this is just an example of an interposition bone graft uh, uh, that's used. And I think this is a learning point for me as well. Perhaps for me, the thing that I would change really moving forward be a bit more of tricortical eyelid crest graft rather than allograft, um, which may be the reason why uh, I have seen some non union uh, when doing these kind of uh, distraction procedures. So, my third message is heel slide art and arthrodesis are useful adjuncts to achieve alignment. Keep in view gastroc recessions and supramal osteotomies. I do a, a fair number of gastroc recessions in conjunction with these procedures uh, to try and get the alignment better, but always, always look at the mechanical axis, and I think that's very important. And that's it, Rajesh. Thank you very much, Go. And uh, we know that it is like uh, almost 12.45 a.m. in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> right. So thank you very much for being with us. And before we move further uh, uh, to both the foreign faculties, can we have uh, extension of another 15, 20 minutes more, Dr. Gow and Dr. Tom? Yes, I'm available. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Tom, your comment on to uh, the last case by Gow. He uses both medial as well as lateral approach. Uh, so I, uh, I enjoyed the presentation. I think the takeaway messages were perfect. Uh, the combination of a medial lateral incision is difficult for me because going medial, uh, I just find there are so many nerves and so many vascular structures uh, that I tend to shy away from the medial approach. But looking at the way Dr. Gao presented that certainly is an option and it's something that I may try the next time. It is important to get a full understanding of your anatomy uh, in the abnormal sense to make sure you're able to correct it into the normal sense. And I, that's the takeaway message that I got from the presentation. So I thought it was terrific. Yeah. Any question, uh, Maninder or Kamal or Pradeep, any question to Dr. Goa? Yes, uh, Maninder. I have a question for to all the panelists and Dr. Rajiv Shah, you as well. Uh, to uh, how do you have you had experience with 3D printing of the calculus malunins and to design where the osteotomy exactly should be? Because what we need to is to restore the you know exact anatomy back, and that's what the aim should be. Uh, and I've, I've had a few cases where the uh, Pradeep also showed a case in his presentation of a 3D printing, and I think it really adds on to the 3D. Uh, yeah, visualization along with the CT scan, a 3D printed model of the calcium. I don't know whether I just like the opinion of the house of what you know if you've had any experience with that. Yeah. So, so may I? Manindar, may I, may I so, Manindar, so far yeah. as I am concerned, 
Yes. I do not know. Uh, maybe because of vast experience of managing uh, uh, man unions, I had never had experience of using 3D printing. I have used 3D printing for so many of deformity correction where yes. I really need triple osteotomies. Uh, mm. I have used 3D printing for total talus replacement or for avascular necrosis of the talus. But I've never had any occasion where I've used 3D printing for uh, uh, calcaneous small union. But the opinion of other panelists. So my, can I? Yeah. So in in right 2020 only, there is a paper by Remelt. I think uh, we all acknowledge that the work done by Remelt on mal union calcaneum is really phenomenal. He is the one who came up with this classification of grade one, zero to grade five. So he writes right in the beginning in the assessment, he says, you don't need even 3D reconstruction to analyze your case. You just need a 2D reconstruction. So the uh, printing is a step ahead. And he clearly says that 2D reconstruction is enough. And actually, you start analyzing and start analyzing your pathoanatomy. You can do, I think, very well. You can analyze all your cases in 2D reconstruction. So I don't think so that we. it will be rather an overkill spending enough money, spending enough time to do a 3D printing and probably do not get any advantage over what information we have over 2D reconstruction images. Yeah, Dr. Ajoy. So, yes, sir. So can I... Our yes, secretary, sir. with his opinion, please. Sir, regarding 3D printing, so we need not actually print these things. What we can do is there are so many softwares which are available. There's Mimix which is available. If we can just feed the DICOM images to that, we can get a 3D model and we can cut it on that the way we want it on the software itself. We need not actually go in for printing. So if we want to pre rehearse the kind of osteotomy that we want to do, have the model on your computer. Plan out the uh, where we want to do the cuts, and we can go ahead and do the osteotomies accordingly. The wastage is not there. Any other opinion, Pradeep? Please. So I agree with. Uh, so I've I've read a lot of papers of Zwip and Remalt as well, and it comes back again to the same point. Because Rajiv Shah sir has done sixty-five cases of Mal Union or his series, he is able to visualize everything. In his mind, with the two D, with the X rays. If we say, if we actually look at Ramal's paper, and all his paper, he doesn't even give his CTs. He just gives standing AP lateral and axial views, and he uh, he tells about the pathoanatomy. So for especially for people who are starting, I think getting a CT scan, two D, three D reconstruction, and for the first few cases, for such complicated cases, having a three D model right in front of you. To understand what is what is happening it really makes sense. And the example which I showed, that patient not only had a subtalar, had an ankle involvement, and right going up to the midfoot, the chopas joint as well. And it was very helpful when I planned the osteotomy because that was a very different um, uh, osteotomy which I've done, which had to go right up to medial. So I had to be very careful how much I go on the medial side. So I think there is a role of that. Um, initially, you get first few cases, get a 3D printing model, and it's not very expensive as well. And probably, I think most of uh, parts of the India are serviced by these companies. Um, have a look at the 3D model, practice it, plan it properly. That really reduces your intraoperative time, your intraoperative uh, surgical time, complication rates, and your radiation as well. Um, yes, you can get software, and we are working on that as well. But I tell you, the technical guys and the software guys are still not up to it. What you can do it. Okay. So since the uh, since somebody has talked about the classification, it has been something very nearer to my heart. Yes, these classifications are fantastic, but Stephen and Sanders gave classification on the basis of just 23 cases. Thereafter, there are no case series onto which Vip and Ramel has given classification. But looking at this, both the classification, say if we talk about a deformity-based classification by Zwip and Ramelt, they have not talked about involvement of calcaneo-cuboid joint, which is 
there in 25% of the calcaneus fracture, you have involvement of calcaneo cuboid joint. The late cases of calcaneus malunion, they present with arthritis of other joints, midfoot joints. Even I had a case of arthritis of ankle joint following the uh, calcaneus malunion. So these classifications talk of only subtalar joint, but you do have problems of other joint. The deformities which are talked do not cover soft tissue deformities like equinus deformity, like cloto, hemato deformities. The differentiation into a tongue type versus intraarticular type is not possible with this classification. And very, very importantly, these classifications do not talk about the nerve issues, issues of the tendon, issues of the soft tissues, and post-surgical malunions are out of this classification. So these are certain important points. And the most important observation, which three series, is, our series as well as two other series, had is there is an overlap of cases into Zweep and Ramit you would be able to classify a case of type 0 into type 3 also in Zwip and Ramel. So that is a confusion. And we had such cases and the similar observations were there in the literature. So this is just a point I wanted to make with respect to the classifications. Uh, any other comment from any panelists? Otherwise, I go to a few of my slides. Anybody wants to say anything? Uh, okay, with the permission of Dr. Go and Dr. Tom, I am going to share my screen. Okay, are you all able to see my screen and listen to me? Yes, in the sir. Yes. Yes. yeah, we can. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, one very, very important tip which I want to give is whenever you are dealing with the post traumatic arthritic cases, post-traumatic calcaneus malunion, try and fuse all three joints because you want a solid fusion. So I always like to fuse all three joints for a post-traumatic such kind of calcaneus malunion. Second important thing, I like to add additional anterior screw described by Roger Mann. So in almost all of my cases, I like to add additional anterior screw. And the third tip is that not all the time you have to look at the uh, iliac crest to get the bone graft. You have a calcaneus from where you can take the bone graft. Look at this, I've taken bone graft from the uh, calcaneus posterior superior angle. You have to be a little careful on to not damaging the tendo Achilles. And then this kind of graft can come and fit like this. So this is one more bone graft site for you when you are dealing with calcaneus malunion. Uh, any question or comment before I move to uh, uh, my one or two cases? Okay, so I move further with uh, one or two cases. Okay, so this was a 31-year-old obese female who had a calcaneus fracture in the United States of America. And this is how uh, she underwent a fixation of a plate. And uh, you could imagine what issues she would be having. Uh, so these x-rays were sent to me and I said, ask your surgeon to immediately remove the plate because a plate is also of obstructing and plate is giving a problem of sural nerve, is now neuralgia. So she underwent removal of the plate. She continued with burning pain in the sole, burning pain in the lateral border of the foot. And probably these two medial screws also gave something like tarsal tunnel pain. So surgeon again went in and removed the medial screws, but still the pain persisted. And then she went on sending me the x-rays. She went on asking my opinion on phone call. 
and then I said, no, you need to come down. So she came down. This is the standing X-ray showing subtalar joint arthritis, talar dorsiflexion, contracture of the tendo Achilles. Heel was into varus. <coughs> there was shortening of the heel. There was sural nerve injury. There was posterior tibial nerve injury. She also had heel fat pad syndrome and clotos. So this is where the problems, and this is what I classify as my type A, D, I, and O, where you have arthritis, deformity, implant, nerve issues, and soft tissue problems. So on exploration, there was non-union between body and the anterior fragment. And subtalar arthritis was also there. So what I did, I took two ilia crest bone graft, and then a bone graft between anterior process Anterior, uh, anterior part of the body and body and anterolateral portion and the bone graft between talus and calcaneus were put in and they were fixed. So body and anterior fragment graft, a graft between talus and body. Patient also underwent a medial exploration, neurolysis and tarsal tunnel release was done. And she also underwent claw to correction like this and went on to heal the second case was a case which was about 12 years post calcaneus fracture. He presented to me with a subtalar joint arthritis, shortening of the hill. As you can see, there is talar dorsiflexion also. There is a plantar exostosis, which required a separate plantar approach. Tendoically shortening. Heel was into valgus, then varus. He had a claw as well as hammer toe. And he had a medial exostosis giving rise to secondary tarsal tunnel syndrome. And then this case required multiple surgeries, distraction, subtalar joint fusion, talar dorsiflexion correction, plantar exosectomy, correction of the heel valgus, medial exosectomy, tarsal tunnel release, and correction of the claw toe. And the third case, had a subtalar arthritis, arthritis of the calcaneocuboid joint, heel varus, lateral wall exostosis together with the clotto. And then with this kind of an extensile lateral approach, which was taken dorsally and distally, I did a double type calcaneocuboid fusion with a packing of the bone grafts taken from the proximal tibia, and did a calcaneocuboid plus a talo calcaneal fusion. So distraction subtalar fusion, in situ CC fusion, lateral and posterior wall exosectomy, correction of the heel varus, hammer to and mallet to correction, like this. So this is how the ultimate end result was there. So before I go for five cases where I just want rapid fire round in view of having opinion of panel. Is there any comment? Is there any uh, question? Uh, I would, you know, be keen to answer that. So then there was a question, sir, that uh, how you go into the interior and the medial uh, middle facets when you're doing the subtalar arthritis? Yeah, so whenever you're going to uh, do subtalar arthritis, you can definitely reach to the anti and uh, 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 middle uh, facet easily. You just have to go uh, beyond your uh, sinus tarsi region and then there you find your anterior and middle facet. You might even in a beginning, if you are a, if you're not experienced, you might like to extend your uh, incision and uh, uh, go up to the uh, middle and uh, uh, anterior facet. I have a question. Yeah, please. Yeah, sir, with all this complex correction in the hind foot, you do the forefoot correction also in the same sitting or you give it a try of physiotherapy and see whether things get corrected on their own or do a later stage? No, I think forefoot correction, all these corrections in all these cases I've done in single sitting. But I think uh, it could be a good idea where you could uh, think of uh, uh, doing it in a stage manner. Uh, I don't have any objection to that. Another uh, question by Dr. Kamal Dureja, sir, he himself. Yeah, yeah. What do you do to the sural nerve if there is sural nerve neuritis? Yeah. 
So uh, uh, most often than not, if there is an offending implant, you just remove the implant. That works well. Or else, in one or two cases, I've gone proximally and I've done uh, resection of the nerve and uh, burial of this nerve into uh, adjoining tissues. Uh, I would like to have comments of uh, Dr. Tom followed by Dr. Gaw on to these three cases. Well, Chief, what a nice job. <clears throat> I mean, that, that, those are very difficult cases and I'm glad you identified the anatomy and I, I agree with the way you address them. I am also impressed, especially in the first case, how well you dealt with the soft tissue because that it, when you look at the lateral border of her foot with all those incisions, I mean, it, it takes courage to make another incision laterally in that area. Go. Rajiv, that's phenomenal. I mean, I think the, the combination of deformities um, is, is, is huge. And I think that question that came earlier about it doing in a stage fashion, uh, just, just give us some, some thought where, you know, especially for, for those starting out with, uh, with this sort of a problem, uh, I think is a good approach. My question is, have you had experience whereby uh, shifting, uh, doing a, a deformity, especially in cases like this, where there's severe soft tissue contracture on one side, uh, or even nerve-related issues on one side, by doing a deformity correction, you then end up with a traction phenomenon on the opposite side? So not really. Uh, in fact, all these cases, I had to go medially also. If you see three out of two, uh, out of uh, these three cases, two cases I had gone medially and I had done the medial release. Uh, the cases, the case like Dr. Vache showed, the kind of an osteotomy, I mean, kind of the uh, correction he aimed with the lateral sided osteotomy. I would also like to go like your approach, Ko, where I am going to put in a medial as well as lateral approach for the correction of uh, such a kind of bad deformity. If you remember, uh, the tuberosity was displaced quite medially in, pro in Dr. Gurunath's case, which mm -hmm. I would have gone with a medial as well as lateral approach. So many times I'm obliged to go medially as well as laterally. So I had, has had no issue of, uh, you know, traction onto the tissues. Uh, so if there are no further questions, uh, I would go ahead with a rapid fire round. These are the cases which are, uh, you know, sent to me for opinion. And uh, I don't have much... Uh, Details of this case is like, if you want that I want a CT of this case, I may or may not have. So uh, uh, it's a, a case, a case which I, I want panelists to opine. Case number one. Uh, so male 27 uh, had uh, a road traffic accident like this and Something similar to the last case you saw go. Yes. And then at 12 months, this patient comes with pain, inability to stand, inability to walk. Uh, Kamal, uh, what do you read uh, in this x-ray? Yeah. So this is basically a complex is, fracture yeah, this dislocation. Axial view, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this is a complex fracture dislocation where you have telonavicular dislocation in addition to uh, the fracture and dislocation of the calcaneus. So these are the cases where you probably, uh, the, these kind of cases will have a lot of soft tissue problems. So uh, you have to handle these cases by understanding them in the CT. I mean, if you ask me to, do these cases just on the basis of x-rays, probably I would not touch them. I would definitely like a CT analysis of these kind of cases. Okay. So you have a CT, you have a CT, and then how are you going to approach this case? Are you, I mean, do you think there is a fracture dislocation of calcaneus? Uh, is there a dislocation of calcaneus in this case? 
Yes, I mean, the, the fracture is quite medial here, probably in the sustentaculum telli and the whole of the calcaneus has moved laterally, you know. Okay. Maninder, you suspect something else in this case, Maninder? Uh, well, you, uh, you've you had, uh, you know, this is a complete uh, Taylor uh, sort of uh, dislocation except for the ankle. Uh, we don't have the ankle x-rays, but I suspect this is, you know, uh, uh, along with the calcaneal fracture, uh, the whole of the there is a midfoot. You see the calcaneal keyboard joint is still out, uh, and arthritic. There is loss of the Taylor head uh, with the Taylor navicular arthritis, and the Taylor is you know your Taylor navicular articulation is completely disjointed and out of line. Uh, so this is a severe injury. Sort of uh, it's a midfoot, hind foot, and ankle. So there's ankle arthritis now as well in the lateral view. So. Uh, you know, this is something which we need to clinically assess. What are the clinical ankle movements? What are the midfoot movements? What is the position of the foot? Is it plantigrade? Uh, and what is the position of the, you know, the forefoot as compared to the hind foot? And then we have to plan for, you know, a correction to get a plantigrade foot. Because at the moment, it looks like, you know, the, the calcaneum is not really weight-bearing on the heel, on the back of the heel. It's more weight-bearing on the middle part of the calcaneum. Uh, so it's sort of uh, the whole of the bowler's angle is completely op lopsided. So I think we need to plan that out uh, with yeah. sort of you know clinical pictures, the clinical examination. I think would be the key here, yeah. along so, with the CT uh, scan. Doctor Tom, Doctor Tom, are you suspecting something else in this case? Well, other than, I'm suspecting a lot. Obviously, there's a this is a high energy entry. Uh, you have joint. You have issues with the ankle joint, subtalar joint, the transverse tarsal joint. Uh, we don't even know what the foot position is. We are concerned about soft tissue, compartment syndrome. So I am suspecting a lot, and I agree with what the panel has said. Trying to get more information on the bony alignment as well as, you know, continuing with the physical exam. So it, it's hard to make a judgment with just these X-rays. Yeah. So is I, there any infection? Yes, exactly. So that is what I was uh, wanting anybody <laughs> from panel to come up and say. There is a drainage. There was a draining sinus, and you can see there are areas because osteolysis and the bone yeah. formation. Yeah. So, like over a period of one year, this much destruction of the joints in a calcaneus malunion may be a very bad injury initially. Cannot happen. So. There was a uh, infection in this case, uh, which uh, uh, was also associated with uh, such a case. So there is an infection, arthritis of the ankle, subtalar, calcaneal cuboid, talonavicular joint with dislocation of the talonavicular joint in this case. So uh, just to bring to uh, uh, the notice of the uh, esteem panel that these are the kind of cases which do come in our setting. Uh, so this is one more such case, Dr. Gaw, uh, who presented was who presented at nine months. Uh, there is no infection, but this is the uh, X-ray picture, lateral view. This is the medial and lateral clinical picture, and this is how he stands and. Uh, he has come to you to get something better. What would you like to offer, Dr. Gong? Ankle foot orthosis. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, you, you are, okay. Anybody, Pradeep, would you like to? I think you've seen this case. Okay, we've Dr. seen Vora. this last week. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Vora. So I won't uh, like uh, to do much. I, I'm with the AFO. And if we really have to do, we have to take help of the plastic surgeons in these cases. We so really you, have have a, uh, you have a fantastic plastic, plastic surgeon in your yes. institute. Yes, we, we, we can. Now, uh, basically, there is a loss of declination. So you have to do a distraction uh, in this case. That is very important. Then of course, as uh, Dr. Kamal Dureja said, that you need to have a CT in such cases. It is very, very difficult to appreciate only on the lateral view what, what you need. On the lateral view, I can only appreciate that there, there is a loss of uh, the height and there is a 
increase teller uh, uh, the teller declination has to be restored and there is a anterior impingement but i cannot see the status of the joints the only thing is you can just open uh, from the posterior side do an osteotomy and i need to have a consult of the plastic surgeon first whether he'll be able to uh, uh, provide me coverage or not so the prime problem here is a soft tissue than more of a bony problem and uh, and what what are you, what are you going to do with uh, uh, okay what are you going to do with uh, uh, tendon achilles dr vora what are you going to do with the tendon achilles tendon achilles uh i don't know what what has happened here but there there doesn't appear to be you know any any tando eclis here so uh just realign the foot and uh, then you may even do a pan uh, uh, ttc fusion in these cases i think there is a small fragment of bone which is avul step no sir that's the tendon yeah, yeah. attachment bone it's an avulsion of the achilles tendon because Achilles small tendon. fragment from the tuberosity has gone yeah up. yeah Yeah, but you could easily actually do a FHL because that fragment is not going to come down. It's been there for quite some time. So instead of that, probably just leave it. If it doesn't come down, just leave it and take the FHL and and put it onto the yeah, remaining the, calcaneum tuberosity. The, the, okay, the issue is so the soft I, I, tissue. Yes. Kamal, I just stop you for a minute because uh, uh, Dr. Tom Lee. Yeah, he has to leave, sir. Yeah. He has to leave. So, so yeah, so, we, sir, thank you very much for thank being you, with sir. us. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for blessing us. Keep thank blessing you, us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And have a great day. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. Okay, Kamal, go ahead with your comments, please. So, so if we are looking at the problems, we have an Achilles tuberosity avulsion. We have a problem of uh, uh, incongruity of the congruity of the uh, talo calcaneal joint lost. We have the problem of the length of the calcaneum which is lost. we have the problem of height of the calcaneum which is lost now if we are wanting to address all the issues to make his gait better first issue would be to make the skin at the back better because unless we make the skin better you know it is the scar is going to fall apart and spoil all your reconstruction work right okay so uh, uh doc uh, anybody has any comment or i move to Or we will go ahead, sir. So we are already quite late, sir. Okay, uh, so Indrajit, uh, we'll wrap up here. Uh, yeah. I'm getting Thank you imagined. very much, Doctor Goy. It's now one one fifteen, I guess. Uh, so what we did, sir? Please show. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, I have given A four to this patient, and fortunately, has not come back to me. Uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay. That's the best thing. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, panelists. Thank you.